welcome back yeah welcome back uh, the first lecture in this series of 30 lectures on uh, tight closure uh, will be given by neil he will give three lectures and conduct one tutorial uh, so neil is from george mason mason university which was mentioned in the lecture here for a conference uh, where hoxter had given uh, his talk uh, so neil uh, welcome and uh, you may start your lectures now. all right well thank you very much uh, to the organizers for uh, for making this uh, this whole thing go um i hope this is uh, good for students and uh, and thanks very much to craig Hunicky for giving his uh, intro talk it's um every time i hear him even though the, even when i hear stuff that's familiar i always learn new stuff and new ways to, to think about things so so thanks there as well and um, okay, so I'll say that um, that my lectures. Um, so uh, there will be some overlap with what he uh, did, because uh, um, but because um, uh, well uh, we didn't we didn't coordinate, and uh, and and so and I'm I'm his student, so that shouldn't be that surprising. Apple doesn't fall far from the tree, right? Um, and. Um, so and so my I would say that my introduction to uh, tight closure theory is going to be um, pretty traditional um, uh, in in particular that I'm going to concentrate on like you know it, as as part of a of a of a set of a collection of closure operations um, and uh, but I'm also going to put put more I'm, I'm going to talk about modules uh, in a way that that he didn't I think they they they're important uh, as, as sort of part of the theory, um, and um, I won't touch uh, a reduction to characteristic uh, p. So I won't touch the characteristic zero case. I don't know if someone else is planning to. Um, and uh, I apologize in advance for my handwriting, but um, you know that's why we have the lecture notes. Um, but but hopefully it'll also be useful to to have me write stuff down well. I'm not sure. Okay, so. Um, so the, the, the notes that I'm putting up have eight sections. I'm going to cover seven of them, I guess. Um, the, um, the first three sections are in the first lecture, and that's cl closure operations and the Frobenius. Um, uh, and um, the Frobenius, I mean, like, not just the Frobenius endomorphism, but also Frobenius closure and the Frobenius functors. Um, and then the second uh, lecture, which will be on, on Wednesday, uh, at the beginning is uh, tight closure and also uh, module finite extensions um, and um, uh, as sort of two topics, but they're inter intricately linked. Um, and then uh, part three is going to be uh, section six and seven of my lecture notes, um, colon capturing test elements and persistence. And you heard um, uh, Craig talk, uh, Dr. Gideke, Craig talk about a number of those uh, of those words already. Um, but I'm going to try to kind of work everything out from first principles um, and uh, kind of a nuts and bolts um, approach. So, so that's sort of my uh, idea of what I'm going to do. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, let's start. Okay. So everyone sees the full screen, right? So the so the first part. Um, so as I said, it's going to be based on 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 the idea of closure operations in general, and so. Um, Section one, what is a closure operation? Okay. So um, definition. So, um, and this definition is due to Eliakim H. Moore from 1910. I don't know if it goes back further. Um, uh, but uh, anyway, so uh, uh, and so let M be a set, and so for that you want to think uh, it's a ring or is an R module. But his definition was on sets; like he was interested in, like Moore was interested in in uh, analysis. So this is just very, very general. Um, but I think that it's useful to, to see what's going on really generally uh, uh, to, to get perspective on, on a lot of things. Um, and let S 
be uh, a collection of subsets of M um, such that, so you, you know that notation two to the M, it's, it's just a collect, that, that's the power set of M. And so uh, this is just gonna be a, just a collection of subsets of M such that um, uh, one, M is one of those sets and two, uh, S is closed under uh, arbitrary intersection. If you have a bunch of sets in S, um, yeah, then uh, um, any intersection of them is also an element of S. Um, and so, and for S, let's think, um, think in terms of um, S is equal to all ideals. Or all submodules uh, in these cases. But it's actually useful to sometimes even think of it as just being the power set, like all elements of, of the of, uh, all subsets of, of it. So um, then um, So a closure operation on S is a function uh, C, I'm going to use like superscript notation from S to S, such that three things hold. Um, it's, the first one's called the extensive or expansive property um, for any and element of S. So I'm using uh, L as the suge suggested notation. Think in terms of submodules or and like M, like a module. Right? For any L and S, um, it's contained in its closure. Right? Um, so, uh, so that's extensiveness. Um, and then this is order preservation, which is that for any uh, K and L in S, uh, such that K contained in L, you have that K closure is contained in L closure. Okay. Um, so these are properties that sort of are, are you know, uh, abstracted from the, from the notion of a Kuratowski closure operation in, in, in topology, right? Um, but not all the properties of it. So, um, and then the third one is idempotence. Uh, for any L and S, if you take the closure of L and you take the closure again, nothing else happens. So um, uh, Craig mentioned that this is the case for integral closure. It's, this is actually just one of the um, axiomatic properties of what a closure is. So this is a closure operation. Um, and um, and uh, if uh, L equals LC, um, sorry about that. So, um, yeah, Zoom has been acting up lately. I don't know why. Anyway, so if, um, so if L is uh, uh, equal to its closure, then we say it's closed. Okay. So, um, so remark the no, the um, M and S uh, is superfluous uh, via the convention that the intersection of the Z of the empty subset of S is just the, the full set. Right? This is a common convention in set theory. Okay. Um, so just a couple of things. All right. So so just right away, let me give an example. If M is a ring and S is um, is the set of all subsets of M, 
of R. I'm going to call it R because it's weird to call it right now. Um, then you can define, you know, the closure of X to be the ideal generated by X. If you think about it, that is a closure operation in this sense. Uh, any subset of a ring is a, a subset of the ideal that it generates. Um, if you have two subsets X and Y of a ring and X is contained in Y, then the ideal generated by X is contained in the ideal generated by Y. And the ideal generated by an ideal is just that same ideal, um, right? Um, you can do the, so, so anyway, so in some sense you've seen this, this concept before. Um, uh, in terms of generation, if you're talking about generation of subrings, you know, generation of modules, and so on. Um, so this is a this is not usually called a closure operation, but um, but it is. Okay. So now let me give you an equivalent um, characterization of um, of closure operations. Um, uh, right. So uh, proposition. Let M and S be as above. Okay. Um, so there is a one to one correspondence between, on the one hand, all the closure operations on S. And this is by also by Bohr, as far as I know. Um, uh, the closure operations on S, on the one hand, and the set of um, subcollections called D of S that are likewise closed under arbitrary intersection. Now, if you think about it, like this is true of ideals, an arbitrary intersection of ideals is an ideal. Um, so, um, and if you know about like the radical is, is, is going to be a closure operation on the set of ideals and the intersection of radical ideals is still radical. So anyway, so hopefully the examples you know um, already, uh, you can see already do this. And, but here's the correspondence. Um, So if you have a closure operation in C, um, you just take the closed elements of S to be your, this uh, subcollection. So um, and it's easy to show from the axioms of the closure operation that any intersection of closed uh, objects of S will be closed. Um, and then the other way, if you have a subcollection uh, D of S that is closed under intersection, um, um, so then now I have to define a, an operation. So I'm going to say that the closure of L is the smallest element of D, um, A of D that contains L. So and so, why is there a smallest one? Um, it's because um, it's because D is closed under intersection. So you just take all the elements of D that contain that contain L, intersect them. You're going to get an element of D, um, and then that'll be the smallest. And it turns out that if you had a subcollection uh, that's closed under intersection, then um, you uh, that then the, this this operation. Um, uh, does satisfy the, prop the property of closure. And these are mutually inverse operations. Um, so, you know, subcollections, so you have a collection that's, collect that's uh, closed under intersection, you take a subcollection that's closed under intersection, then, then you, you get a closure operation. And in general, um, um, so indeed, for any uh, subset uh, of S, um, the, uh, the assignment, uh, 
of just take, uh, taking an element of S and, and taking it to the intersection uh, of those uh, K in E that contain L. Uh, is going to be a closure operation. So for instance, if S is instead of ideals of R and E is equal to the prime ideals, then the Neil, I'm not sure what happened. Looks like your sharing stopped. Yeah, apparently Zoom's going to keep quitting out for a while. Sorry about that. I don't know why. Um, it's been doing this lately. It didn't do that this before the last update. So, um, so okay. So, uh, so for instance, so where, where was I? So, um, if you have a collection of elements of S. Um, and uh, you say, okay, I want to intersect all the elements of E that contain L, um, then that is going to be uh, a closure operation. Um, and so, for instance, if, you, if S is the ideals of R and E is the, the prime ideals of R, which is not closed under, under intersection generally, then the resulting closure operation is what, is what I call the radical what Craig was calling the nil radical of, uh, of, the, of an ideal. OK, so I think this is a perspective on closure operations that isn't really emphasized very often. But, I, but it's, you know, it's, it's useful. I think it's a useful thing because um, so these, these no, so, so usually the definition of closure operations is just given as these three things, which might seem like, a, you know, a, a laundry list. It's like, OK, so you get bigger, uh, you preserve containment, and if you do it twice, it's the same as doing it once. But in some sense, that's not arbitrary. It's just um, the same as saying, you know, okay, I'm, I'm taking a collection of elements of S and I want to intersect them uh, to get my closure. Um, right. Okay. So, and so, but of course, for these lectures, uh, typically M is going to be a module M in, in the above. Is a module or a ring, uh, and then S is going to be all ideals, respectively submodules, and then we're going to say that C is going to be a closure up, closure operation on M rather than on S. So closure operation on a module, I mean the closure operation on the collection of submodules of that module. And a closure operation on a ring is the closure operation on the on the ideals of that ring. So not the generation thing that I said. But I would just want to point out that generating, you know, generation is itself a closure operation um, on the sets. Okay. So, but um, okay, so so that's the more stuff. So um, here's a definition. Um, I think this is by Petro. Um, so uh, we want uh, our closure operations to be uh, to, to be well behaved in terms of multiplication. And I think uh, Craig mentioned something like this for interval closure. Um, so a closure operation C on a ring R is called semi prime for historical reasons. Doesn't have anything to do with the prime ideals. Um, for if for all ideals i and j, uh, j times the closure of i is contained in the closure of ji. And hence, j closure times i closure is also contained in ji closure just by changing the roles and the rings commutative. Anyway. Um, and in particular, um, um, if um, 
well, I'm going to skip that line, but I'll just say that good things come from semi primeness that, um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just say it. Um, if, um, if C is a semi prime operation on R, um, and if I is C closed, then so is I colon J for all I kills J. And hence the minimal primary components of, of, uh, of I are also going to be uh, closed. Because, you know, by a T McDonald or whatever, those are, those are always colons. Um, so the proof is, is, is just this, uh, J times uh, the closure of IJ is contained in J times the uh, times i colon j closure, which by definition of i colon j is just i. So i colon j closure is contained in i closure colon j, um, but uh, but um, that's i. Um, anyway, okay. Very good. So it's like um, maybe Zoom was uh, quitting out. Well, hopefully uh, Professor Epstein will rejoin right away. So sorry. So more generally, you want to uh, define a closure operation on. Um, um, on a co whole collection of modules, a category of our modules. So, um, so closure operation on a category of our modules. And there you want to use the notation closure in M. Uh, yeah, but you often want it to be, uh, it was for every module, you, you define a closure operation on it, but you want those to be well related. And, and so the, the thing we have is called functorial. Um, and that means um, that for all R linear G from M to N, you know, in the category, um, and for all uh, submodules L of M, if you take the closure of L in M and you apply G, uh, you get inside the closure of G of L in N. Um, okay, so, um, so lemma, um, any um, factorial closure, on M, which is either the category of finitely generated R modules or just R modules, uh, is um, satisfies what? Um, I closure times L closure in M is contained in the closure of I L in M um, for all ideals I. And for all models. 
in uh, M. Um, and so hence, if you just let M also equal R, this shows that it's semi-prime. And uh, all the closure operations that we're going to deal with are going to be are going to be functorial. Um, and the proof is um, the proof. I mean, I, I keep quitting out as case in point. Uh, so maybe I'll skip that proof, but it's it's a it's elementary. It's an elementary proof. Um, okay. Um, so, and your first examples of closure operations are the identity uh, closure operation, which just sends every uh, mod submodule to itself, um, and the, the radical, which we're only defining on ideals. Uh, although you could define it on submodules but using those maps to fields that, that Craig mentioned. Um, there's a paper by Colder Brenner that does that. Um, but anyway, um, okay. so um, two, the Frobenius endomorphism and Frobenius closure. Okay, um, so from now on, all rings are commutative, Ethereum, and characteristic P. Prime, positive. Um, and, uh, okay. So um, consider the uh, map from R to R that just sends an element to its piece power and uh, lemma, and let's call this the freshman's dream. Um, right, um, in calculus classes, everybody, like a, a lot of people often think that A plus B quantity squared has to be A squared plus B squared, and that's usually false, but in characteristic two, it's true. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and um, yeah, Craig mentioned this. Um, let Q be a power of P and uh, X and Y be in R. Then X plus Y to the Qth power is equal to X to the Qth power plus Y to the Qth power. And of course, my proof is the, you know, the proof, uh, the one that, that, that uh, Professor Hineke alluded to, which was, um, had to do with binomial Yeah, sure. Sorry. There you go. Is that good? Yeah, thank you. So I'm going to prove that this because it's so fundamental um, to, to what, what, what follows. Um, so it's enough to, I claim it's enough to show it for E equal one. In other words, Q equals P. Uh, because it, otherwise, uh, it just follows by, by a very quick induction. You know, x plus y to the p to the e is equal to x plus y to the p to the p to the e minus one, which is then x to the p plus y to the p to the p to the e minus one, and then by induction, that's x to the q plus y to the q. So, um, so let's prove it for e equals one. Um, so, by the binomial theorem. Uh, x plus y to the p, what is it? It's x of p plus y of p plus the sum from i equals 1 to p minus 1 of p choose i, uh, a, sorry, x to the p minus, x to the i, y to the p minus i, right? Everybody knows that. Um, but for each i between 1 and p minus 1, um, let's look at P choose I. P choose I is P factorial divided by an I factorial times P minus I factorial. And P divides numerator 
but P does not divide denominator. And that's because all the factors in the denominator are less than P, and P is a prime number, and there's no, and there's no uh, uh, way to multiply things that are less than P and get a multiple of P because P is a prime number. Um, so um, thus, P divides P choose I. Let's say uh, that P choose I is equal to P times N sub I. Um, so then the I sum N in the above becomes uh, N sub I times P times X to the I wide of P minus I. But because the ring is characteristic zero, sorry, because the ring isn't characteristic zero, because the ring is characteristic P, this is N sub I times zero. And so all of these sum ends are all zero. And so what's left is X to the P plus Y to the P. All right, question three. So now let's talk about the functors F E upper star and F E lower star. Um, so in general, right, um, let G from R to S be any ring homomorphism. Okay. Um, then you have, then you can have two uh, functors. Um, so one obtains uh, the extension of scalars functor g upper star from r mod to s mod, where what you do, uh, at least on modules, is you tensor with s. And the restriction of scalars under to lower star from S mod to R mod. And what you do there is that G lower star of N is an R module via, you take the same abelian group structure. Um, uh, R times G lower star of an element X and N is just uh, going to be uh, well, so R times X is going to be G of R times X, which makes sense because N is an X mod N, N is a S module and G of R is an element of S. Um, and so we often write uh, R times G lower star of X and then G lower star of uh, G of R X. Um, okay. And so um, for any iterate F E of the Frobenius functor, you then obtain At the upper star from R mod to R mod, and at the lower star from R mod to R mod. So that seems very abstract. So let me tell you concretely what at the upper star is, if you happen to have a, a, a presentation of your module. Um, so um, so if um, given the presentation, R to the T, R to the S, M zero of a finitely generated module uh, by, a, and you have this matrix AIJ of elements of, of R, this S by T matrix, um, then, uh, F the upper star 
of M is just the co-kernel of, you take the elements of that matrix to the P to the E power. So that's, that's, that's sort of how to think very concretely if you, if you have a presentation of your matrix. And so in particular, that tells you uh, what goes on for, a for, for an ideal. So in particular, if I is an ideal, let's say it's generated by x1 through x uh, t, then that gives you this presentation rt to r, here, s is equal to 1 here. Um, so fe upper star of r mod i is r mod the ideal generated by x1 to the e through x t to the e. And then what's going to be useful later you, here's a change. I, just, just one comment. Uh, when you are writing here on equality, this is not an equality. This is actually an isomorphism, a natural isomorphism, uh, even by, if yeah, you want to be precise. Sure, natural isomorphism. Good. Um, so here's a change of rings uh, lemma. Um, let S be a ring. And remember, all of our rings are prime characteristic in theory. And um, I be an ideal, R equal S mod I. And I won't prove this. I'm just, I mean, the proof is, is, in the, is in the notes, but uh, we'll use this as an operating principle. Um, then for any R module M, uh, well, um, sorry, that's a typo for any S module M. M mod I M is an R module. And uh, if you want to take out the upper star of it, it's the same as you, uh, with respect to R, it's the same as taking out the upper star with respect to S of M and modding out by I times F and star. That's going to be useful later. Okay, um, so um, it makes sense to really meditate on this for um, uh stuff. So let's meditate some more. Um, so let's talk about the qth root extension. Um, so um, suppose R is reduced. Um, Okay. Um, let K um, be the product of the algebraic closers of the rings R mod script P for P minimal primes of R. Um, then what you have is that. So that product of the R mod P's is the total ring of fractions of R. And so it contains R. So then R uh, embeds into K. Um, and um, for any power P of P, um, write R1 over Q to be uh, those elements of K such that uh, their Q's power lands back in R. Um, then here's a fact, um, R1 over Q is abstractly isomorphic to R. Right, basically, um, since every element of R has a unique Qth root in K. So it has a Qth root in K because of you know, algebraic closure and stuff. Um, uh, the uniqueness is basically because K is reduced. 
um, if alpha and beta are in K and alpha of the Q equals beta of the Q, then, well, it's reduced and also freshman street. What do you have? Alpha minus beta to the Q is equal to alpha to the Q minus beta to the Q by freshman stream, which is then zero. So since K is reduced, alpha minus beta is zero. So alpha is beta. Okay. So, so right, so we can just sort of, so, so, um, so, but, but of course, the usual way to consider R and R1 over Q to be related is to think of the inclusion um, between them. Um, R is a, you know, is, sits naturally as a sub, um, as a sub um, rate of R. So, um, so let P from R1 over Q to R be the isomorphism. Um, that sends alpha to alpha to the Q. And I from R to R1 over Q, the natural inclusion. Then what do you have? Um, phi compose I is uh, the, the e to the power of the Prometheus. Um, so you can think of the Frobenius at um, so up to isomorphism. Uh, Fe can be thought um, is like the inclusion R into R one over Q, and that's often a very useful way to think about about it. Uh, Neil, there's a question in the chat. Yes. Yes, the question says, uh, if R is a graded structure, will R1 over Q also have a graded structure? Yes, absolutely. But uh, you got to be careful. It's uh, So if it's graded by the group G, then in some sense, um, uh, the um, R1 over Q has the, is graded by the group 1 over Q times G. So like, um, like that's sort of the natural, the natural way to do it. Um, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so right, so the Q, basically the Qth root of any element is uh, of say degree D is going to have degree D over Q. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's that's a useful um, um, thing for a lot of applications. So yeah, good question. Okay. So now let's talk about racket powers of ideals and submodules. Um, so, um, so if I is an ideal and Q is the power of P, um, the Q bracket power of I is defined in any of the following equivalent ways. Right, Craig already said some of this. Um, I to the bracket of Q is uh, generated by the set A to the Q, A and R. It's not usually equal to that set because that set's not usually um, uh, an ideal, <laughs> but, um, but it's, it's the, the ideal generated by it. Um, so suppose you have a generating set for I, Then uh, I setting I to Q just be the ideal generated by these. That, that was the uh, Nile, one question. Uh, just uh, le, le, let me ask you one question. Uh, one of the participants is also uh, also has the same question. What do you mean by an abstract isomorphism in this case? Because before, oh, uh, because of course, uh, you, in in some books like Harshon, it's just like uh, an abstract. It means that you choose a basis. Somehow. Oh no! I, I just I just literally mean that they're isomorphic. And, oh, okay, and, and that's it. But but as R modules as abelian groups or like as rings as rings as rings. Okay, okay, good. As rings, yeah, they're isomorphic as rings. Okay. That's what I mean. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So um, so as I said before, basically, I bracket Q is the annihilator. Of F the upper star of R mod I, which is a cyclic R module 
And so, uh, as I said before, FBI upper star of R mod I is basically R mod I vector two. And if R is reduced, then if you take I and you extend it to R one over Q, thought of as a as the you know an ex a ring extension of, of R, um, it's the same thing as what happens if you take I bracket Q and you take the Qth roots of all the elements. So those are the equivalent ways to define um, bracket powers of an ideal. Now for a submodule, um, more generally, let L, M, L and M be our modules. Um, then, um, and let I be the inclusion. Just the inclusion map of modules. Then Fe upper star of I from Fe upper star of L to Fe upper star of M is reduced. And then L bracket Q in M is defined to be the image of, of that, of Fe upper star of I. Um, and note, if M equals R, then the two definitions coincide. And we identify at the upper star of R with R. Okay, so, um, so now I have my first exercise. And I won't state it here. I'll just say um, bracket powers have nice algebraic properties. OK. So now let's define the Frobenius closure of an ideal definition or a module. So. If X is an R and I is an ideal, we say that X is in the Frobenius closure of I. If um, by definition, um, there's a power Q of P such that X to the Q is in I bracket Q. And more generally, if you have R modules and X and M, then uh, X is in the Frobenius closure of L and M uh, means that there's some power of Q with uh, X, Q, M. Oh, I forgot to note make that notation uh, in L bracket Q M. So what do I mean by that? Um, so notation, um, if you have inclusion from L, L from I into M and X, Sorry. Let n equal r x in m. Let's have this i be the inclusion map. Then uh, x q m is f the upper star of i of x. But by the algebra of, of bracket powers, which you'll do as an exercise, it, it, this also kind of works nicely. Um, and so lemma, um, is Frobenius closure is a functorial closure operation on R modules, on the category of all R modules. Um, okay, 
So I guess I have what four minutes left before questions. Um, so I wanted to state one more theorem, and that has to do with regularity in the flatness of the weakness. Uh, but maybe I should do that next time, and instead I'll prove this. Uh, I'll prove this, and I'll get to the regularity next time. So, proof. Um, so let L be a submodule of M. We want to show that uh, the Cubini's closure of M is in fact a submodule. Okay. So let X and Y be in Cubini's uh, closure of L and M, and let R be in R. <coughs> Then what do you have? So X is in some LQM, Y is in, sorry, X to the Q is in LQM, Y to the Q prime is in LQ prime M. Um, so, and then what do you have? X plus RY to the Q, Q prime um, by the algebra of these powers is x to the qq prime m plus r to the qq prime, y to the qq prime m, which is x to the q m the q prime in something, plus r to the qq prime times y to the q prime in m to the q in something. Um, and then that's in lqm to the q prime plus lq prime m to the q, and then that's L Q Q prime M. So it's a module. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, it contains L by setting Q equal one. Um, containment preserving uh, is, I, I claim, clear. I hope. Uh, basically, because KQM is contained in LQM, ready Q. Um, so let's just do item potence and functoriality. So let uh, X, let Z be an L for BDS closure of M for BDS closure in M. Okay. Um, then that means that there is a Q such that ZQM. Is in the is in the qth bracket power of the previous closure of M, um, and um, so that means that there exists y1 through yt in the previous closure of M, and r1 through rt in R, with zqm is equal to the sum ri yi qm. Um, and each yi admits some q prime, some qi, with uh, yi qi and m is in lqm because these are in the Frobenius closure of l and m. Um, should be a qi. Okay, so let q prime be the maximum of qis. And also Q. So just take the maximum of all those things and call it Q prime. Um, then Z to the Q prime uh, is equal to the sum from I equals one to the T, RI to the Q prime over Q, um, YI um, to the Q prime. Q prime is, is a multiple of Q, so that makes sense. Um, and, um, but each of these, um, are in, um, LQIM to the Q prime over QI, which is then in LQM, LQ prime. M. So Z is in the Frobenius closure of L. 
Um, and let's just do functoriality. So let M be an R module. L and M and G are linear. And let Z be in the Frobenius closure of L and M. Um, then there's a Q with ZQ is an LQM. And again, by the algebra of Frobenius um, uh, powers, um, G of Z, Q. Um, is going to be in Fe star of G of ZQ, which is in, sorry, that's equal to it, um, which is in Fe star of G of LQM. And then by the exercise, this is contained in G of L. Thus, G of Z is in G of L. So it's a nice functorial closure operation. I'm sorry I had to rush it. I'm sorry I, I did rush at the end. <laughs> I won't say I had to. All right. So, um, questions. We started a little late, so let's take a few minutes for questions. Yeah, I have a question real quick. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, for starters, I, I like this phrase, meditate on Frobenius. I think that should have been my, meditations on Frobenius should have been the title of my dissertation or something. But, <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, um, uh, I did have a question. So as you were defining kind of these, these abstract closures, um, you mentioned semi-primality semi for ideal closures and functoriality for module closures. So I really, I can obviously see why functoriality is the right thing to look at for module closures. Like it makes a lot of sense that that's sort of very natural to run into. But for semi-primality, it seems a little less obvious um, as to why that's the natural thing to look at to me. Um, do you have any insight on why semi-primality might be natural to look at here? Well, I mean, if you care about primary decomposition, then uh, it has nice um, 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 uh, uh, I, I would say semi-primality is like the poor man's version of functoriality. It's, I mean, it ends up being equivalent to saying that any R linear map from R to R um, is, uh, uh, preserves the, the, the closure in this sense. Um, yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's actually equivalent because R linear maps from R to R, the same thing as homothetics, right? The, the, the right. same thing is picking up of R and, you know, the map is multiplied by that element. And so this semi-prime thing says exactly that that's going to preserve that, you know, uh, I mean, it basically says that the, that element A times the closure of I is contained in the closure of AI. Um, and, uh, you know, you can make sort of crazy, crazy closure operations where that doesn't happen. But um, for instance, that happens in all these star and semi-star operations that the, that the you know, that, that's popular in the non-Ethereum world. And it's true in, you know, tight closure, previous closure, integral closure, radical. I mean, I don't know. It's not really a good re reason to say that it's, that it's natural. But I mean, to me, it's like um, functorial on maps to R. And not every closure operation has like a, the obvious way to define it on modules, like for instance, radical and even integral closure takes a lot of work to define it on modules. Um, and um, and so, you know, the semi-primality is a, is a stand in for that. Functoriality on homotheities. That's a good, good way to put yeah. it. So, uh, Neil, are you saying integral closure of modules is a semi-prime operation? Um, I'm saying it's functorial. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I hope it is. I think it's, I mean, there's a lot of definitions of, of integral closure of, of modules and like, um, but I think in all the in all the existing ones, they, they are actually functorial. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
ओके दिस इज क्वेश्चन इन चैट और इस रिलेशन बिटवीन फ्रोबिनिस क्लोजर एंड इंटीग्रल क्लोजर ओह या आई गेट अम सो आई वाज गोइंग टू गेट इनटू दैट लेटर इन द लेक्चर्स फ्रोबिनिस क्लोजर इज सो प्रेडी अम इंटीग्रल क्लोजर इज बिगर um is 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 the short answer but in fact you have a whole uh, sequence of closures on uh, uh, uh um so for any ideal i the fermenius closure of i is contained in the tight closure of i which in turn is contained in the inner closure of i which in turn is contained in the radical of i um and and, and yeah, just like it. tight closure has uh, characteristic z zero analog does frobenius closure also have characteristic z zero analog um i don't think so um i mean i've never seen it i mean i guess you could try to do reduction to characteristic p i mean the natural thing would would be to say that in all the characteristic p models i'm sorry that in infinitely many characteristic p models the 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 that sort of the very the that characteristic p version of the element would be in the fermenius closure of the characteristic p version of the of the ideal but i mean yeah i've never seen anybody do that um mm. there i mean there's reasons like i mean um for a long time people thought that that you know tight closure would have this property that if you know if you're in the tight closure in all in infinitely many characteristic p models that you're going to be in the tight closure in almost all of them um but then uh, brenner and um uh katzman have a counter example to that so that's you know it's not true um and it, but it was known from early on that that wasn't true with fermenius closure i have an example in my in my in my lecture notes uh, at the end um, okay so but yeah um i guess you could make that definition of fermenius closure but in general fermenius closure is considered to be more poorly behaved in many ways than tight closure um, mm -hmm. that's a, a segue to another question that i have and this i guess is more related to uh to material from from craig's talk so feel free to defer but um i'm very interested personally in my own research in studying fermenius closure um and in particular i've been trying to develop the right you know and may maybe it's it's out there uh but the right map theoretic notion to get integral closure of ideal or sorry for bnes closure of ideals so is there a notion of you know maps to the right kinds of rings that when you can track back you're going to get the bnes closure oh yeah um i mean let me just be careful um yeah so there's this thing called the um I don't know if this maps to them but I mean I will say there's this thing called the perfect closure of 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 a ring which is the and you probably know about it um which is the um uh, uh just all the all the basically all the r to the 1 over q's at once like the union of of the r to the 1 over q's in in that ring k that I that I showed um assuming the rings reduced um and uh and so and uh and one way to find for b closure is extend to that ring and contract that um and um and similarly you know you look at the for a, for a module if you have a module m uh you look at the natural map from m to m tensor with it's called r perf it used to be called r infinity but everyone says r perf now um for perfect um so you look at the map from r, uh, m to m to uh, m tensor r perf and you look at your submodule l and you look at the elements that that in that map land inside l tensor r perf i mean that's the elements of m that land in l tensor r perf um and you call and then that's that's the fermenius closure of l and m um but i i don't know if that's what you what you're asking for a little bit i mean so r to r perf is an example of a purely inseparable extension right so uh, i'm wondering if something like you know if you can track i back from the purely inseparable extension of even of certain flavors that you'll get um get the renus closure but anyway this is a research question that's not maybe not appropriate for the science so. <laughs> I, I bet that'll work huh. 
Okay, yeah, interesting. Yeah, maybe I'll follow up with you some other time. Thanks. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Can I ask you something new? Of course, Arena. Yeah, uh, this is not regarding what you covered, but like, is this first part of your talk will broadly follow your paper on like closure operation in commutative algebra? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, yeah, that's, that's sort of where I, I that, that's when I, I developed this, um, this approach um, is, um, yeah, I, I, that, that's, that's in there, yeah. Um, some version of that's in there, but I mean, some version of that's in the, in these lecture notes too, that, that you'll see soon enough. Um, yeah, you know, um, I want to do a survey on closure operations and I was the, and I thought, well, how broadly defined are these things? And like really broadly, they're even more broadly defined than this. After Moore did his stuff, um, then like, you know, uh, poset theorists said, okay, well, you can sort of define this on any poset. It doesn't have to be the, the post set of subsets of a given set. It can just be any partially ordered set. And then you, you change your containment relations to you know the 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 less than or equal to sign that exists in that post set. You still and and then it's still if it's a if it's a post set where where all arbitrary meets exist, um, then you know then then you, you still get this one to one correspondence that Moore um, pointed out in his paper 112 years ago. Um, so yeah, I mean it's very it's very general, um, and and that's you know they, they use that it's somehow in lattice theory in a way that I don't. Uh, that I've never looked into. <laughs> um, Any other questions? But yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. But yeah, Kyle, I'll happily defer your question to anybody that might know more about it than, than I do. <laughs> Yeah, more questions. I've looked and it seems like no one has written about about. I mean, much less has written about Fresenius closure closure, which is where I'm trying to make That's my right. niche. Yeah, so. No, it's great. 